Welcome to the second day of our eighth annual symposium on wildness, wilderness, and the imagination. My name is Ben Percy, and I'm an assistant professor in the English department. It is my pleasure to welcome Tony Dore and Rolf Potts here today. They're going, their panel is going to be moderated by one of our all-star graduate students, Lindsay Deandra. And I would ask that you silence your cell phones now. Uh, I would also ask that you check out our brochure, if you didn't grab one on the way in. Uh, we have events coming up all through the day, including Rolf's reading at 4 in this room and Anthony Doerr's reading in the sunroom at 7 p.m. this evening. Uh, following this, there'll be a reception, so if you want to hang out, have some snacks, and uh, corner the authors who would love it if you bought their book available in the lobby there. <laughs> and uh, force them to pen their signature in it. So, please welcome the gang. Are you going to sit here at some point or you stay up there? I can sit actually. I don't care, yeah. I was just going to sit, maybe leave this for you. Yeah, no, yeah. take the space. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 8th Annual Symposium on Wildness and to this afternoon's panel on travel writing. We are really excited and honored to welcome novelist Anthony Doerr and travel writer Rolf Potts, who are here to share their experiences in storytelling from rarefied regions of the world and the human imagination. This world is at once growing smaller in some ways and larger in others. Growing smaller with the interventions of technology and growing larger as global economies continue to separate certain ways of life from others. As our world changes, an element that has been preserved is that constant pull toward escape, that desire to understand, to read about, to, to travel, and to write about parts of the world that seem to live outside of our imaginations. Today we will hear, hear from two different perspectives on travel and place, two modes of understanding our world and how we approach all of its corners in writing and on foot. From this panel, we hope to learn a little bit more about the role of place in storytelling, both fiction and nonfiction, and what it means in our global world to read the familiar and the unfamiliar, to explore the less traveled within the widely read. As Ben said, my name is Lindsay DeAndrea. I'm a student in Iowa State's MFA program for creative writing and the environmental imagination. And I will be moderating today's panel. There will be some time at the end of the panel discussion for audience questions. So if there's something that isn't covered here, um, make a note of it and you will have time to ask it at the end of the panel. Before we begin, I just wanna introduce a little bit more about our panelists. Anthony Doerr is the author of four books, The Shell Collector, About Grace, Four Seasons in Rome, and most recently, The Memory Wall. From Montana to Liberia, Idaho to Norway, Doors Short Fiction is widely known for its scope, spanning several continents, covering a diverse range of subjects, and featuring all kinds of different characters and their unique stories. He has won, among a long list of others, the Rome Prize, several fellowships, the National Magazine Award for Fiction, two Pushcart Prizes, and the 2010 Short Story Prize. In 2007, the British literary magazine Granta placed Doerr on its list of 21 best young American novelists. He also writes a regular column on science books for the Boston Globe. Rolf Potts has reported for more, for more than 60 countries for the likes of National Geographic Traveler, The New Yorker, Outside Magazine, and The New York Times Magazine, among others. His adventures spanning six continents include piloting a fishing boat 900 miles down the Laotian Mekong, hitch hiking across Eastern Europe, traversing Israel on foot, bicycling, bicycling across Burma, and traveling across the world for six weeks with no luggage or bags of any kind. Rolf Potts is widely known for promoting the ethic of independent travel, as in his acclaimed book, Vagabonding. His, new, his newest book, Marco Polo Didn't Go There, became the first American authored book to win Italy's prestigious Chatwin Prize for travel, travel writing. So with that, um, I'd like to open the panel with just a start of origin. Um, what draws both of you or what, what first drew you to the idea of travel, both in reality on foot and on the page, and to telling stories from these sort of different kinds of locations? You wanna start off? Sure, yeah, this working? <laughs> 
Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, what drew me to travel? Uh, I grew up in a place maybe a little bit like Ames. I grew up in rural Ohio, about an hour east of Cleveland. And I was the impertinent kid who would complain to my parents, why do we live here so flat? Uh, and I had maps on my walls from the time I was very young. I remember like maps of Patagonia and maps of Alaska. And my mom had a National Geographic subscription. So all those romantic trapped Midwesterner tropes I fell into. You know, I love looking at all those pictures in National Geographic. And now when I go back to Ohio, I realize I miss it. I miss the hardwood trees and those lush summers with the fireflies spiraling up at night. But uh, I was ready to leave when I was 18, and I didn't go back for quite a long time. I'm in a similar situation. We have a, a lot of Midwestern representation, I think, at the conference this year. I grew up in Kansas, uh, in Wichita. <clears throat> and... Um, like the, my favorite part of the year each year was going to Missouri or Colorado or someplace that felt exotic at that age to me. Um, and I had a really Protestant relationship with travel, I guess, just sort of the idea that you work hard your whole life and then you retire and maybe you can travel if you feel like it sort of thing. Um, but I, uh, at a very young age, my grandfather was a Kansas farmer who quit school in the eighth grade to, to farm. Um, and about the time he retired, my grandmother was um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so I realized as a teenager that that old ethic of being rewarded for a virtuous life of hard work doesn't always pay off in real life. Um, and so I resolved while young to travel. I went to college in Oregon uh, for a while. And then uh, when I was, I worked for a year as a landscaper in Seattle, and then I decided to scratch my travel itch by traveling around the United States and living in a van for seven months. Um, and I'm still traveling, uh, almost 20 years later. So it didn't really scratch my travel itch. I think I realized how, how easy and inexpensive and accessible travel is. Um, and a lot of those ideas went in my first book, uh, Vagabonding. And then since that first U.S. trip, I didn't have a passport until I was 25, um, but now I've traveled to many countries since then. So that sort of got the ball rolling. Was there a second half to the question? Um, that was pretty much okay. pretty good. Um, Okay, so Mr. Potts, one of the things you've stressed, stressed is the importance of, of going slow in travel, taking your time visiting and living in foreign places in order to absorb a more dynamic understanding of a place. And Mr. Dorr, I understand that you're a really big fan of research and preparing a story. Um, and I was hoping that you could both speak a little bit about the necessity of absorbing um, and connecting to a place to generate these strong stories, whether fiction or nonfiction. I can kick that off. Sure. Um, well, that also ties into my first book, Vagabonding, which is about the idea that your relationship with travel is going to be different if you travel for six months or a year than if you do a typical vacation of one or two weeks. And Tony and I were talking, he, he asked me the great question, what do you do when you get sick, or how do you deal with bad food on the road? And my answer was sort of, it depends on what kind of trip I'm on. If I'm on a two-week trip to Southeast Asia and I get malaria, well, then it's going to ruin my trip. But I've had malaria twice in Southeast Asia, and I wasn't, I was just there indefinitely. I didn't have a plan to go home, and I just got over my disease, and it became a part of my experience, uh, and I moved on. Um, it's also, from, from a narrative standpoint, from a writing standpoint, this is another thing we were talking about at lunch, um, how often the traveler experiences other countries but within the tourist ma matrix, which sort of reduces you to the role of a consumer. Um, and I think the longer you travel and the slower you go, the more you can get through that uh, that sort of consumer dynamic of travel. Um, and I think that's the reason why so many so much great nonfiction and fiction about faraway places comes from returned Peace Corps volunteers, um, which includes like Bob Shakojis and Paul Theroux and Tony D'Souza and Peter Hessler, it's because they they've they've broken through that veneer of of tourism. They've learned local languages and they've understood place, places at an intuitive level. And so I'm not saying you can't write about a place that you've only been to for a day or a week because many of the stories in my newest book are about fairly brief encounters. But at that level of encounter, you almost have to acknowledge your role as an outsider and someone who might be seen in that, in that sort of consumer role as guest. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure it has a different dynamic for a fiction writer. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. Um... I've kept a journal uh, ever since I was 16. 
And my friends used to make a lot of fun of me for it and call it my man diary. Be like, <laughs> what are you writing in there? But it was never really a place to just like complain about Susie dumping me in 11th grade or something. It wasn't as so much about myself at all as just a place to practice translating the world into sentences. And early on I learned that when I was in a strange, unfamiliar place, especially if I was a little bit uncomfortable, I was writing a lot more in my journal than uh, if I was at home. And really all of my work, um, my chief interest in life is about habitualization, which is just, you know, taking the same route to work every day. And, you know, those of you who've lived in the same house for a long time and cooked a thousand meals in there, you know where everything is in every drawer. And I'm interested in seeing those habits not necessarily shattered, but uh, shaken up a little bit. You know, it's like when you rent a house and you get there in the dark and you've got to cook a meal. It's a much more intense experience. And that's how I feel when I'm in a strange place, especially if people around me aren't speaking English. And so really, for me, beginning to even pretend to know a place for fiction comes from that journal and just writing sentences that you'll never know if they'll be used in anything finished. Uh, a great uh, liberating thing in a journal, especially if you're handwriting it, is that you know this isn't something that people will see, and it's a very different kind of writing than, you know, uh, writing for publication. Uh, and even if I'm doing a travel piece, which I've only done a few nonfiction travel pieces, uh, you know, I still keep a journal uh, in addition to the notes I'm taking for for a magazine. Um, just because, you know, it's free. You can, your sentences can be crappy. And you can uh, write about the way a tree intersects with the sky for as long as you want. You, know? you don't have to worry about it. the readers of the New York Times getting super bored. So uh, for me, uh, beginning to absorb a place starts with being, going slow and looking at it and trying to translate it into sentences. And, you know, if you're interested in writing, just start doing that in airports. You know, play little games with yourself. You know, you can make up stories about people. You probably already do that in your head, you know. We, we have so many distractions and increasingly uh, great ones, like Downton Abbey or something, you know, we were just talking about. But uh, it's important to also slow down and just have a notebook that doesn't also have Scrabble on it or something, you know. And write, write with your hands and ink. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to, to this idea of, of story, both in, in fiction and, and nonfiction, when you're, when you're traveling and you have these sort of experiences or when you pick up on some information that, that you feel might, might work really well for a story, what is it that sort of tells you that, that these stories are the ones that, that you want to start with, that you want to tell? of all the people that you meet on your traveling or of all the, the characters that pop into your head, what are the ones that sort of connect, you connect with the most? Sometimes it's something you know immediately and sometimes it might not occur to you until months later when you're sitting down at your desk, you know, which, which parts of a travel experience uh, resonated with you the most. Um, yeah, it, it's tough, and I, I guess this sort of addresses the whole idea of your consciousness as a traveler versus your consciousness as a writer who's traveling, and are you having experiences to have experiences, or are you having experiences to collect experiences? And if you start taking notes in the middle of experience, is it going to ruin your experience, or is it going to ruin your writing? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I think once you're in a certain writer mindset, you can't ever stop thinking about, how am I going to write about this? Mm. And you don't want to sort of prostitute your consciousness constantly towards the act of writing because you want to have something spontaneous and, and, and true going on. But I, I think also the writer's, that writer's consciousness can, al can also challenge you to do things and engage people in a way that you wouldn't normally. Again, going back to the consumer level of travel where you're sort of receiving experiences and, and comfort and new sights as opposed mm -hmm. to experiencing them. Um, so I'm trying to think of, of specific examples. Um, well, like in my latest book, I have a story about this really eccentric guy in, uh, in Beirut who was so friendly and so overwhelmingly hospitable that I named the story My Beirut Hostage Crisis. I just couldn't, he, he was so nice, I couldn't get away from him. I, I, I knew immediately that I was going to write about him. Uh, and the, one of the biggest challenges was just because he was so flamboyant. Actually, if you come, I'll, I'll touch on this in my reading. Um, he was so flamboyant, it was a matter of what not to write about him because lesbi uh, lesbian, <laughs> Lebanon is a very serious place. Um, <laughs> that wasn't even a Freudian slip. He was a dude. 
Le Lebanon is a serious um, is a serious place, and there's something very comical about this guy named Mr. Ibrahim. But if I just concentrated on the comical aspects of him, just a very eccentric, weird guy, then it would have sold short what the true story was, which is how this guy reacted to living in a place that should be a great, you know, Mediterranean city, but isn't because of war. Um, and so I immediately knew I was going to write about him. Somebody I didn't know I was going to write about until months later uh, was my barber when I lived in Thailand and was writing my first book, who was a Burmese refugee and over the course of many haircuts I realized had lived a much more interesting life than a lot of adventure travelers you read about in Outside Magazine. Um, and it was probably two years later that I realized I should probably write about him because he represented something very true about Thailand or the Thai-Burmese border where I was. And it was probably two years after that before I figured out how to write about him um, because he had become, um, he'd become a friend and, and uh, I wanted to sort of honor who he was. Um, and so it was, it was hard finding a way in. So I guess there's, you know, there's different ways to approach a, a given travel experience and sometimes what you think is the obvious one doesn't make any sense when you sit down to write it. Um, and sometimes you sit down to write it and suddenly you're writing something that you had no, no plan on writing about. So. Know how it is for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just entirely different. I'm a fiction writer, and um, uh, you know, I'm not looking at people as material necessarily. Uh, you know, when I'm writing fiction, I'm just playing with language, and the way a songwriter is playing with a keyboard until a tune emerges, or a painter is moving paint around until an image emerges. Uh, I'm very rarely so schematic that I would cannibalize a real person from an encounter that would seem slightly um, commercial or capitalist or something like, oh, I've met her, now I'll put her in a story. Uh, so for me, uh, you know, fiction comes much more out of uh, conflict and interests. Um, often, you know, to, maybe to answer your question, how do you know if you're onto something? For me, it's if I have a curiosity that I, won't let me go um, and I just want to learn more about it, whether it's venomous snails or the way seeds are preserved or um, hibernation. I was talking to Lindsay earlier about that. Um, you know, one of my stories just uh, the, called The Hunter's Wife just came out of an interest I had in hibernation. Like, what the hell are frogs doing with their hearts beating, you know, once a minute in the middle of the winter all around us right now? Are they dreaming? Is that even considered being alive? Uh, and then only after, you know, 20 days of playing around with sentences will characters and conflict start to emerge up out of that. So writing fiction about different places is a very different kind of thing, I think. Right. Um, going back to sort of the idea of, of the, the man in, in Beirut that you, that you met and speaking about the true story behind something, and that's really, really the heart of it. For both of you, I was wondering, all writers commonly seek a sense of universality in their writing, and so both of you achieve that very well in your work. How do you kind of balance the local and the global or the microscope, the micro with the macro, um, how, and how can other writers maybe focus on a specific place, on a, an even foreign place at times, and and still achieve that sense of, of universality? I think that's an important, almost an important mission for a travel writer, a, a nonfiction travel writer, because as a travel writer, you're in a unique position to navigate the space between news media, which is panic driven, you know, you're not going to read about certain parts of the world unless something blows up there. Um, and then the other pole, which is advertising and, and sort of tourist images that um, show us golden or clear blue waters and empty beaches, which don't exist either. And so we're navigating um, the middle ground, which is making far flung parts of the world seem human. And so I guess one mission or one thing that I find myself returning to is going to a, a faraway place and finding what is relatable about it or finding what is essential and human about it. Even though it might be culturally different, there are certain things that, um, that one can hold in common. Um, and you used, you used uh, Ibrahim, the Lebanon story, as an example. I think um, using the specific to speak to the universal, I was, my mission um, in that story was ended up being to write about this one eccentric man in such a way that his story said something about the place, that his story was tied into Beirut, uh, and the fact that his, the fact that he, he couldn't physically talk about parts of the city 
that had been destroyed by war. He pretended to exist, uh, pretend they didn't exist. He took me around the city showing me only fancy restaurants and beautiful monuments and stuff. And so much of his Beirut was this um, sort of this, this, he was sort of this Don Quixote figure, you know, sort of this fantastical, the Beirut that could have been. And if you go to Beirut, it's easy to understand that this could be a fantastic city. I mean, the Lebanese people there are so nice and they're, they're very good business people. And, but they, they've been sort of, they've lost out to geography. And so it ended up being that the, the universals of the city were communicated through this strange man I met um, named Mr. Ibrahim. And that's something I come back to a lot in, in a nonfiction context. Um, yeah, that's a much easier question for me as a fiction writer. You know, the path to the universal is through the individual. And um, some, maybe it was Bernini, some Italian sculptor said, the art which is not a trifle is composed of trifles. And I think what he meant is, you know, you're just making thousands and thousands of little chisel strokes on a piece of marble. And eventually maybe you've made something transcendent, but 99% of your energy is in the work, in the hammering away. And... Uh, you know, that's how I feel about sentences. You know, you're working with these used and abused elements of everyday life, which are words, and you're trying to build something transcendent out of it. And w what my students, what young writers, whatever age, but young in their careers, what they seem to miss is that they're striving for really big ideas often, you know, love or getting their heart broken. And often big ideas don't make for compelling narrative. And what does make for compelling narrative is very, very small, specific details. And that's you know why I love to leave home and to learn things about other places, because when you're there, you get to see what, um, what a bakery smells like. Or Lindsay took me past an incinerator last night. On the way into town, there's a big incinerator, you know? And like, that's a smell for Ames, Iowa, you know, that I won't forget. And <laughs> that cold, you know, breath of all that steam going up into the night, that's, that is a way to conjure a place. You know, often, especially undergraduate fiction will sometimes involve, like, oh, I didn't want to set it anywhere because I wanted it to be every place, USA, every town, USA. But really, if you want to write about every town, USA, invent the most specific and unique and idiosyncratic town you can, and eventually the people there will say something about every town, USA, if they're real and specific enough. For me, you know, I came into reading because I wanted to be transported into other lives. Ultimately, I believe that empathy can be achieved through fiction and that, you know, fiction is a moral thing. You, you read so that you are not alone and you read to believe that human experiences can be shared. And um, so the more specific a story, really, the more engaging it is for me. Now, thinking along the lines of, of sort of Italo Calvino's imagined settings in, in invisible cities, and that question of how can we accurately and sort of artfully navigate the place, like between a place itself and the experience or our perception of that place, so that it, it almost in some ways becomes entirely imaginary, um, something that, that I think is interesting. Um, and Mr. Dorr, I, I understand that obviously with memory wall, memory is a big part of understanding place. And I'm sure for someone who travels as much as you do, Mr. Potts, that um, memory of a place informs your writing as much as actually being there. So I was, I was wondering, what is the, the difference between imagination or, or sort of the mindscape and the actual landscape? And how do the two sort of play off of each other? I'll let you start Good that. Questions, man. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly the difference. I think that is what you're always struggling with. You know, what is objectivity? You know, if you're in Vilnius, Lithuania, and you've just fallen in love, it looks different than if you're 3,000 miles away from home and scared and, you know, you have a headache or something. Um, although somebody made a great <laughs> There was a great joke at lunch today about how maybe you're in love and you have gastroenteritis, and those are the same thing. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, we talked about John Muir at lunch today, and that's a perfect example of somebody like you can go in a book called Travels in Alaska, I think it's Travels in Alaska. You, you can see Alaska a thousand times, but it's not quite like seeing it through the consciousness of John Muir and that ecstatic burst of prose and somebody in love with exclamation points and leaping from boulder to boulder. And, you know, some people get tired of it, but I don't. I'm just like, oh, ecstasy for 20,000, you know, pages of John Muir. That's great. I'll take it. 
And so you can't separate, of course. And I think it's maybe um, a fallacy to even suggest that you could write an objective story. It would feel dead. I mean, the, the eyes of the person through which you see a place, whether it's a fictional character or Rolf Potts, you know, that determines what you're seeing. And that's, that's the joy. Like I said, reading is transportation, and that's what I want to be. I want to be transported into other worlds and other eyes and other minds. Well, one reason I, I kicked that question to you is that you do an interesting job in Four Seasons of Rome of talking about difference, of talking about being new to a place and how newness makes a place um, feel alive. And like old habits, you can actually learn things about your home by suddenly listening to sirens in Rome or you know, trying to find the screen on a window that doesn't have yeah, screens. Yeah, trying to flush a toilet or buy bread or buy diapers. Those things are more exactly. challenging if you're in another country. Exactly. So those are details, I think, that you or, – or, yeah, things that you brought out very effectively in that book. And those are encouraging words for someone who wants to go to a new place and write about those places because I think sometimes fresh eyes um, are as legitimate as the eyes of locals or the, the eyes of habit. Uh, and there's people who live in New York or Ames or Rio who have stopped seeing their, their own city. You know, So um, just because someone has invested uh, half a lifetime in a place doesn't mean that they are an authority on it because odds are they eat at the same restaurant every week and they have stopped seeing their own home in, with the eyes of a traveler. So um, one advantage of, of, um, of, of using travel as a way to see places, including your own home, is that it, it gives you those fresh eyes that I think are as important as deep, as deep research. Um, and I, I think you should, one shouldn't do it at the expense of deep research. I did a, another chapter in my book is about Australia, and I had a lot of very fresh insights um, um, of what, it, what was happening to me at, at each moment and, and what was new about that. But I knew that Australia is a place – I was traveling in aboriginal parts of Australia, and I know that that's a very politically loaded um, thing to write about in Australia. And so I realized that despite the conclusions I had made and the things that I had seen – in the fleeting time I was there, that I was going to have to go back in the writing and really learn a lot about the history and the, and the politics of, of Aboriginal life in Australia, lest it end up being a well-observed but very naive essay. So, um, so I guess there's a balance, but, but just you know, adding on to what I was observing about uh, Tony's book about Rome is that fresh eyes count for a lot and that even those simple differences uh, can make a place uh, come alive in writing. It's true. I mean, if those of you who like the novel Lolita, I mean, those are fresh eyes on the English language in a sense because mm. he didn't grow up with all the patterns and habits and cliches of an English speaker. Uh, so that's what I mean by habitualization. You know, and I'm hard on my students who resort to cliches because I feel like you know, when you resort to a cliche, it's one small but significant failure to your work. You know, you're sleepwalking through a sentence. And you know, I'm interested in writing because I don't want to sleepwalk through life. I feel like we have a very, very, very appallingly brief time on Earth, and we're here to see as much as we can and understand and do as much good as we can before we're gone. And you know, when you go see Spider-Man 15, which I will do, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, you're you know everything that's going to happen in that film. You know that structure, that pattern is a habit. You know that a white lead will kiss a white female lead, uh, you know, four seconds before the credits, and you can predict everything else that will happen in there. And sometimes it's fine. You're tired. You know, you had a long day. Uh, it's okay to expect the familiar and pay nine dollars for it, but there's also something to shaking up your life and you know challenging yourself to see things in new ways and force yourself out of the habits. Whether it's a simple decision as today I'm going to walk a different route to the union, or you know today I'm going to bring my mother into my dorm room, you know that changes the way you see familiar things very quickly. Uh, <laughs> You know, those little decisions during the day can really make a difference. And that's what I mean by cliché. Using clichés in sentences is a small failure. While we're talking about sort of seeing all that we can while we're, while we're here, going back to that first question about, about origins, home has come out, up actually several times in this panel. Um, I was wondering, despite all the work that you do, the different um, countries that you write about, the different places that you write about, Sort of what is what is the tension or is there a tension in the idea of home when you write about other places or when you travel to other places? Um, and how does home or the idea of home influence your craft? 
You want to start it? Sure. Um, home has changed quite a bit for me since I had kids seven years ago. Uh, home is a real thing for me, and um, it changes everything about travel, not just your writing. You know, you feel a little sick and sad if you're gone for very long, and uh, you feel guilty, and um, home is a lot more important and fun place to be when you have children. Um, in terms of work, you know, often the work I'm drawn to the most uh, is work that involves some kind of spatial tension in fiction. Somebody is somewhere, but they long to be somewhere else. You know, you give a character in Milwaukee a uh, lover in Jamaica, and suddenly there's spatial tension. There's a, a, a uh, dialectic set up between, in that sense, also between tropical and Milwaukee. Uh, which is about as different as you can get, but also, you know, that somebody, there's desire implicit, that somebody longs to be somewhere else, and that's what good fiction comes out of, I think, is desire, you know, longing, striving against your current situation. I, I thought a, a couple different things came to mind. One was this 1977 New Yorker article about querencia, which somebody just forwarded to me, and I'll probably misquote it exactly, but querencia is sort of an affection for home, um, it's a Spanish word, that sort of gives you a sense of place in the world, that by loving and knowing a specific place, then you have a context to appreciate other parts in the world. Um, and I forget what they mentioned in that story. I, I'm, I'm thinking that they mentioned, um, like, Conrad's knowledge of London helped him understand the Congo, but then I think he's another second language writer. Um, and so, uh, to me, I, I recently got a house in Kansas, and I think that has helped. Having an affection for a single place has helped me interpret um, other places and the people that live there, the people who relate to a place that I see as a foreign place. These people relate to it as home. And going back again to Mr. Ibrahim, you know, he, his his love, he had an insane love for Beirut, um, and so that and that was part of his character was tied up in, into who he was as home. Um, at home. The second half, the second thing I thought of is how much home has changed. How um, living in Ames, Iowa 100 years ago uh, gave you a different relationship with place than living in Ames, Iowa now, when you can have Facebook friends all over the place and you know, you're tweeting certain experiences and you're getting, you're watching a Spider Man movie that's set in, you know, we're, we're not Gotham City, that's, that's yeah. Superman. Uh, but just uh, our, our relationship with where we are and our relationship with place is is less place based. Um, and is this another lunch conversation? That was a really productive lunch. The, the, the idea that you can you have more images in a in a day than you used to see in a lifetime, um, and that actually we were talking about the Jardin des Plantes in Paris, the botanical gardens, and how in the 18th century and the 19th century um, you couldn't just fly to South America and Africa to see what the jungle looked like. And so a lot of French artists would go to the botanical gardens and see their exotic species and make paintings. A lot of writers would go if they wanted to describe the jungle based upon the botanical gardens in Paris. Um, we don't have that problem now. We don't have that challenge now. Uh, and we might not, uh, another example, I remember being in Mongolia a few years ago and my driver said, oh look, there's a step fox. And where? There's a step fox. Well, it was t like two miles away. We didn't see the step fox until it was 200 yards away. Well, he sees the landscape in a different way. You know, we, we, we see in an urban sense now, and we navigate life um, in, in a context that's full of people and things and images. Whereas someone who had lived a more pastoral life in Mongolia, he'd probably be overwhelmed in a city, but he can see a step, a step fox when it's two miles away. So that was the second thought I had, that we are experiencing home in different ways in, in 2012 than we did in 1982 or 1882. Yeah, it's so true that technology in some ways can get in the way of really experiencing a place, especially if you're missing somebody back home and you're on your phone a lot. You can go through a day in Florence and still half of your whole soul is in Iowa, you know, and that is a blessing and a curse all at once. It makes me think, what you were just saying makes me think of this really interesting writer named Wade Davis who writes uh, really well about Polynesian navigators and how... You know, in American schools, we're just drilled that progress is this curve that sweeps ever upward and that our lives are so much better than our grandparents. And man, our grandparents' lives were so much better than their great-grandparents. And isn't our toilet paper so soft? And isn't it so great to have avocados in January? And, th and those things are a miracle. But, um, you know, I remember when we, we lived in Rome for a year and, you know, walking through the forum, 
you would overhear tour guides say, you know, notice how the masonry gets better the deeper we go. That like literally we've lost a lot of skills in the in the pantheon and the roof of the pantheon. This is the longest still standing structure with a roof in the world. There's cement, it's 2,100 years old in that roof that we still don't understand exactly how it was mixed. You know, like the men, women maybe mixing that cement, uh, you know, we had skills that we've totally lost. Wade Davis writes about these navigators who would be able to tell, they grow up basically in canoes or at sea much more than they're on land. And they would be able to tell if there are islands coming, even though you couldn't see them with the naked eye, just by the patterns of waves around them, that they could tell how far away they were from land. And that's how they managed these unbelievable crossings, you know, 4,000 miles of ocean in an open boat. So, you know, I do get nostalgic for that sometimes. You know, my sons, I try to teach them about the weeds around the house, but often I run up against the limits of my own ignorance. You know, I'm like, I think this is an invasive species, but maybe we shouldn't pull it. I don't know. And they're like, can we go play Super Mario Brothers, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> Jared Diamond talked about that in the context of mushrooms in Papua New Guinea, you know, that people who lived there knew more than a scientist would ever know about mushrooms because they'd grown up knowing exactly which ones to eat and which ones not to eat. And just since you mentioned toilet paper, um, the, even the idea that soft to toilet paper is the best way to clean yourself is a culturally rel uh, relative statement. I mean, you go to India and people use water. And if you say to them, why do you use water? That's gross. They'll say, if you had dung on your face, would you wipe it off with paper or would you wash it off with water? And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> So, you know, I, those are the very basic relationships that travel can completely transform your relationship with Charmin, you know. So, um, uh, it, I guess it's just another example of how your home, you can see your home through a different lens. You it's know? so true. Yeah. And then when I was 19, I spent seven months in Kenya and Tanzania, and I remember coming back and... All I really had to drink there was tea, beer, or Fanta. They had, like, very delicious Fanta there. And I came home and I remember going into the convenience store and just seeing the drinks. It was, like, before even Monster Energy drinks and Red Bull took over the convenience store. And just, like, we have so many drinks in America. You know, something you would never, ever realize. Like, why do we need 17 flavors of Gatorade? <laughs> Thank you. Um... Just one last question before we, we go to the audience. Um, speaking in the area of craft and maybe also a little bit about ethics, which is something that we've touched on, for, are, what are some common mistakes you find um, when writers attempt to write about experience, cultural experiences outside of their realm, whether it be it through nonfiction or through fiction? Um, what, are, what are some ethical problems in that or, or some complications that come up um, and how do you how do you remain truly faithful to a place that you're writing about? Well, that's that's a question that's dogged travel writing since there's been travel writing, um, simply because it's harder to fact check a story when you can't fly to some place or you don't have an internet connection. And travel writing has had a bad and I'm talking about nonfiction travel writing has had a bad reputation since the beginning, because there's no way to verify that the tribe of Africans who had a giant lip that covered their head in the sunshine existed, or the race of men who hopped around on one leg, or the, the giant delicious bean that was as big as your forearm and tasted like honey. Well, that, that third one is something Marco Polo talked about, and people made fun of him for it when he came back, but he was just describing a banana, right? So um, travel writing has always sort of existed in the haze of distance. And it's only recently that, it's another thing I write about in my book, it's only recently that um, you can write about uh, somebody in Ethiopia or Cambodia or Paraguay and then they can read what you wrote and say, and call BS on you, right? So I think to a, to a bigger extent, a lot of these cross-cultural issues are um, being sort of policed uh, in, in a 2.0 sense. You know, collectively we're sort of po uh, policing each other's cultural, cultural perception of each other. Um, but how to, how to approach it ethically, I guess just beware of expectations and stereotypes, um, learn how to listen, know your limitations. Um, I have severe linguistic, uh, interpretations, so I know if I'm communicating with a lot of people in Cambodia, for instance, it's probably going to be Cambodians who can speak English because I can't speak Cambodian and that's going to affect the nature of who I'm talking with and who I get my information from. Um, 
And I think just sort of acknowledging complexity and portraying complexity uh, is important for the same reasons I said before, is that you're not going to get it through the news and you're not going to get it through, through tourism advertising. Uh, and, you know, talking about the common humanity, you know, addre addressing the common humanity of other places without being too hippy-dippy and, and generalist and completely bland about it, because even though we do have a lot in common as humans, we obviously have huge cultural differences that have to be understood and parsed and, and confronted and, and bumped up against. And so I feel like that's something. I, don't, I guess I don't have a pat answer. I guess it comes in the effort of being, being true to the places you're trying to experience. Um, yeah, in terms of fiction writing, you know, it's all a matter of degrees. You know, I mean, you have to claim a lot of cultural knowledge just to write a story set uh, in your neighbor's house. You know, I mean, there's a lot about that family's culture that you don't know. Uh, I just tell my students to not let the write what you know advice. Have you guys all heard that advice before? Write what you know. Uh, not to let that um, kill their imaginative, imaginative ambition. Um, if you're interested in writing about violent making or a Finnish washerwoman in 1750, you're going to have to do a lot of work if you're not a violent maker or you didn't live in 1750, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. I mean, I think the effort of making your work plausible is your responsibility. And if you can convince readers that this universe is real and you've only alienated, say, one in 10,000 readers, then um, because you've got a mollusk in the wrong ocean, for example, not that I've ever done that, <laughs> um, but, you know, occasionally, uh, if you slip on a detail, that's, you know, that's, you're a small failure of responsibility, but, um, as long as you're a responsible researcher, I think you should try. Okay. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm sure that we've only skimmed the surface of, of everything that, that these guys want to share with us. So, um, I can open the questions to the audience now, if anybody has any anything pressing that they, they feel they would like to ask. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned deep research, and I wondered if uh, either or both of you would like to comment on uh, maybe less usual or interesting example of deep research that you may have resorted to. Um, sure, yeah. I, I don't know if I use the adjective deep because I don't really know what is deep or shallow. Um, I, as a fiction writer, the great joy is that everything you're curious in, about can eventually be useful to you. Um, so yeah, one example, um, I think I'm going to read a story tonight called The Deep, um, uh, which is set in the 1920s. Yeah, The Deep, interesting. Um, and uh, one of the characters in there speaks often uses very ridiculous similes and uh, at a garage sale I came across this book I think it was maybe 1919 a very tiny pamphlet and it's like overused similes or something like that and it was a gold mine for me you know it was like five cents and the papers all yellow and falling apart but you know, I wish I could give you some examples some really racist examples in there uh, and, you know, misogynist ones, but, you know, it's all these ones that, these cliches that have now become new again. Uh, so, you know, I use those and put them in the mouth of a character. I guess that's one example. There are a lot of different things you can do besides just library research, I guess is what I'm saying. I use a Sears catalog, right now I'm writing a book set during World War II, and I use Sears catalogs a lot and looking through them just to see, like, what might be on a dresser in 1940 or what might be in an ice chest, you know, those things are very, um, it's a m magical thing that you can bring those, with a few keystrokes, you can bring up those images right in front of your eyes in Boise, Idaho, where I live, you know. I, I love the idea of, of using popular culture instead of academic culture to, to make a place or a time period come alive. I think that's true. I've, I've heard a historian say once that if you want to write about the 1930s and you're wondering if you understand the 1930s, Open up a New Yorker and see if you if the cartoons are funny, and if the cartoons aren't funny, then you probably don't understand the 1930s enough to get those jokes, and you probably need to research a little bit more about that place. Uh, I have a friend, actually Gina Oshner, she graduated from uh, from Iowa State. I think she got an MA from Iowa State. She writes a lot of stories set in um, in Eastern Europe and Russia, um, which she has. You know, she's she's never lived there as an expatriate. She's visited them quite a bit, and 
we were talking about ways, she and I were talking about ways to get into the place, and I, I challenged her to learn a joke in every place that she went. And I think that there's something, if you can learn a joke, because so many jokes are tied to language or culture or social expectations, that jokes can be an interesting window into place. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of counterintuitive ways to, to get to know a place in a deep way. And one great way is to stay there for a while. So it, it, I think it's hard to beat being in a place and engaging a place for a long time. Um, we don't always have that option, but that's a, that's a great way to, to approach it. Yeah, in the back. Well, you have, I have a house, but you have a house and a <laughs> wife and kids, so I'll let you start. Um, it, they've changed the means by which you do your riding, that's for sure. You have to be a lot more efficient when you have two little kids sprinting around everywhere. But uh, no, I mean, maybe you think a little differently about a traumatic situation with a young child in a, in a story. Um, certainly, uh, maybe I have a little deeper level of empathy for parents, too, characters who are also parents and they're having to make some complicated decision in a fictional situation. Uh, but no, I think I'm very happy I did it. And, uh, you know, you can still be a very productive writer. As Ben Percy, you, you know, introduced uh, this panel, you know, he's got two kids and is writing something basically every day. So you can, you can get it done. Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned that the idea of coherencia before, you know, the idea of home giving you context. I think since, and it comes with getting older too. I mean, who, who you are at different points of your life informs who what you write about. But a lot of what I wrote about early in my career, before I had a home, before I had that querencia thing to come back to, there was a lot of fish out of water type first impression things. And I think now I'm, I'm entering more into, there's more context in my writing. Um, there's actually more of myself in my writing. I'm, my, my writing is getting more personal in some ways. I'm, I'm coming into my writing in ways that it, it didn't used to. Um, and so, yeah, but I think that's that's tied into like very few twenty-one-year-olds own a house, and so or, or are married with kids, and so it's tied into your age and your life stage situation. I think it's good. I think we travel differently, and we as, just as we write differently in different stages of life, um, and and to just adapt and keep trying. And then, yeah, I have a lot of respect for you guys with kids, and I have two nephews, and I can't imagine how you can create time to write. But, but like you insinuated, it informs your writing. You suddenly understand at a gut level what it's like to be a, a parent, for example. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to be productive, just get a mortgage, and then suddenly you have to be productive. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes incentive is good. Any other questions? Yeah, Deb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All the time. I mean, yeah, I was on book tour in Germany once, and uh, there, my uh, escort, she was like, oh, there, there's one added uh, event we were going to take you to tonight. So we left Berlin in, like, this tiny car, <laughs> like an hour. I'm like, where are we going? It's really dark through these woods, and we come to this gymnasium, and inside are a bunch of teachers uh, all women around tables in a full circle, and there's a podium. And she's like, okay, now you can read from your book. I'm like, okay, that sounds terrible. <laughs> and you go up to the microphone, and they're still eating their backs to me. There's no introduction. I'm like, hello. <laughs> and I read for a little while, like this very, I don't know why I chose this passage about insects in the winter in Alaska. <laughs> And afterward, they get in line. I'm like, wow, they're all going to buy copies of my book. And they were teachers who were looking for accreditation, like they had to go to something in English. And so they, I had to sign like 45 forms for these teachers to show that they came to my event. And then you drive an hour back in this tiny car. And I sat in my hotel in Berlin. I'm like, you know, this is why I left, this is why I left my home, to do this? You know? I have an equivalent story of that, actually. Um, 
of signing um, books in the shopping mall of, of my adopted hometown in Kansas and how I'd done these very well attended events in New York and Seattle. And there I am sitting in the mall with a bunch of people who just don't care at all about my travel book. And then I, I sort of tried to engage people and I felt like like a guy dressed as a chipmunk handing out flyers to a donut shop on a big street. You know, it was that very deep humiliation that comes with that. Actually, I was I, I, I wasn't um I wasn't just farting around with my cell phone. I actually in 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 a very postmodern nod to Tony, I actually tweeted one of his quotes the other day. Um, and I tweeted, it says, the easier an experience, the fainter our sensation of it becomes. Complexities wane, miracles become unremarkable. So I think the humiliation that comes with travel is a way of embracing, you know, being. You know, it's a way of, of getting past the superficial comfort level of life and, um, and getting closer to the edge of, of experience. Um, and I've had a lot of, yeah. I, I think unless you're being regularly humiliated, you're not traveling hard enough, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a really nice question, Deborah. It's so true. I, in the, the book that Rolf briefly mentioned that I wrote called Four Seasons in Rome, I finally, after about six months, I felt like I was getting Italian a little bit. We would always go to the grocer where you have to ask for everything. Everything's either behind glass in terms of the meat or it's up on a shelf behind the grocer. So you have to learn the vocabulary for all this stuff. And I remember I want, we wanted to make spaghetti and I just needed a can of tomatoes and I kept asking for pompelmo. I wanted sugo di pompelmo, which is grapefruit sauce. And I'm like, <laughs> and sugo di pomodoro is uh, tomato sauce. I'm like, I want that sugo di pompelmo. Sugo di... <laughs> And the guy's like, what the hell? We don't have that. I'm like, what is this problem? I'm fluent. I'm totally fluent in Italian. What is your problem? I want my grapefruit sauce. We might have time. Yeah, John. Yeah, those are great questions. It, if there is the carbon credit moment at the gates of heaven, uh, Rolf is going to be sent away first. <laughs> so I take comfort in that. I beat, I beat myself up about that all the time. You know, like how can Al Gore give this whole important movie and not once mention how many times he flew to get it made? Um, you know, absolutely. Uh, the one thing that's very paralyzing, though, is living in a state of guilt all the time. And so lately my wife and I are just trying to acknowledge the things that we are doing in terms of composting and biking to work and small decisions and being realistic about the impact that we have versus, say, the United States Army or, you know, the <laughs> Pentagon uh, every day or Disney World. Um, so yes, I feel very complicated feelings about that and you have to believe that your work um, is exposing enough um, people to these morally complicated questions that it's worth it, it's worth it ultimately, but yeah, it's a in terms of the fossil fuel question, that's a really good question. Do you want to talk about the other one or that one too? Well, um, I will say traveling slow is a nice way, is, is I guess, a more sustainable um, uh, way to travel in that regard, whereas traveling, taking one flight to Asia and traveling overland for a year is going to be a lot less 
impact than your average business person has, you know, commuting. I mean, train the planes are the new buses, really, um, or the new trains. That it's just um, flying is a very banal week to week thing, and and people fly all over the United States. Um, and so I think it's easy to to pinpoint tourist travel, but I think business travel, you know, can rack up. And I, we both flew here. Um, can rack up uh, as much uh, impact. And uh, one nice thing about uh, slow travel, too, is even economically, you'll be going on bus lines and train lines and staying in, in, in hotels that are owned locally, and and um, you'll, you'll be learning and reporting back about maybe ways that some people live more sustainably. Um, as far as finding a place that you love and being afraid to write about it, that's that's tough. It's, it's a question that comes up a lot. Travel writers deal with it a lot. And um, remember that movie, The Beach, that Leonardo DiCaprio movie. It was a, it was a book before before that. It sort of it deals with that very question of, of an idea that well, it, it sort of deals with the idea that places are spoiled when other people show up. That that it's okay to be a tourist until people who are exactly like you start showing up and <laughs> start reminding you just how awkward and dorky you are in this beautiful place. Um, and that's why I'm a big proponent of. Um, just making it very, very personal and, and knowing what you love about places because, um, sure, there's there's a level at which um, beautiful white sand beaches or um, very beautiful stretches of rainforest or something are run the risk of being overrun. But that comes sort of in the consumer sense, I think. If you, if you travel in such a way that you're finding personal resonance instead of general aesthetic resonance in places, then probably the places you fall in love with are so personal that it's not really something that you're going to s sell out. You know, like I've fallen in love with Saline County, Kansas, having lived there, and I doubt there's going to be a tourist crush no matter what I write about <laughs> Saline County, Kansas. Um, so yeah, I, the great thing about your question is it's hard to answer definitively. You know, it's, uh, it's tied up in how, we, in how we live these days. Any other thoughts? About, about uh, I question? have some, uh, some of my closest friends are, uh, once a year they do a pilgrimage to Belize and fish for permit, which is for a fly fisherman is the ultimate catch. Like if you catch two permit in your life, you've had a very successful life. And uh, they, um, they are very reluctant for me to ever go with them for just that reason. And I totally understand that. They're like, you know, you can't ever write anything about this. And so, you know, I get that. I have friends who put like warning rattlesnake signs all around their favorite fishing holes in Idaho, you know, for the same reason. So <laughs> I get that proprietariness of place for sure. Okay, well, it looks like we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. Yeah.